the scientific revolution was deciding, realizing that those tools uh, were key, the ones that we should stick with and we should throw out all the other tools. And these tools include innovative use of instruments, uh, repeatable experiments, mathematical laws and descriptions, logically careful arguments from verified empirical premises, seeking a consensus of experts. That's, uh, these are all features of ancient science. Now, what they were doing other things as well that were less reliable than this, but when you look at the stuff that was really working, this is what they had in there. And of course, this led to them realizing the Earth is a sphere, uh, and they actually calculated the size of the Earth uh, accurately to about 10% uh, using geometry. Uh, they knew if you have an empire, by the way, that spans uh, you know thousands of miles, and you're sitting on a round planet, uh, your maps don't work. Uh, you need to figure out how do you map a curved surface on a flat space. So they developed uh, cartography. The Roman astronomer Ptolemy actually developed uh, systems of cartographic projection that allowed you to map. Uh, curvature of the Earth on flat surfaces. He developed a variety of different systems, and he developed uh, our modern system that we still use today of latitudes and longitudes. So uh, by measuring where we are on the planet with a latitude and longitude, that's his idea. That's, if you want to know what have the Romans ever done for us, well, that is one solid thing they definitely did for us that we're still using today. Uh, they, calculate, they used trigonometry to calculate the distance of the moon and were accurate, essentially, uh, about 200,000 miles. Uh, that's quite a feat. They uh, were aware of the fact that the lunar orbit was elliptical. They were still trying to figure out exactly how it worked. Um, but they knew that the actual motion of uh, the moon uh, moved in elliptical fashion. They knew that it moved in an inconstant velocity. So these ideas of perfect circles, perfect velocities, that's Copernicus, actually. Copernicus was going backwards when he did those things. He was going forwards with the heliocentrism part, uh, but he was going backwards with, by dumping all the other innovations the Romans got to that actually were correct. And they did a lot of other things. Uh, now this is a Greek instrument I'm about to talk about. Uh, off the island of Antikythera uh, in the Greek islands, uh, in about 1910, sponge divers found this uh, machine. This machine was built about probably 120 BC. It was on a ship that sank around 88 BC. And uh, it's called the Antikythera computer. There's lots of stuff online about it. Uh, it's actually a computer. Um, it, uh, it's an analog computer, obviously not digital. And it uses a drive wheel and a huge system of really complicated gearing and dial readouts. Uh, this is, these are rusted pieces of it that have been recovered. That's the main drive wheel. This here you can see, if you look closely, you can see the, one of the dial readouts uh, at the top there. Uh, also, if you look really closely at that one, you'll see some Greek letters because the instruction manual was written on it. Uh, here's some bunch of the gears fused together uh, in that. Uh, so we x-rayed the hell out of this thing and tried to figure out how it worked. So now we've built some. Uh, these are replicas. Uh, this is the most authentic replica here, uh, using wood and bronze the same way they did. So what did this, this thing do? Uh, it used its dial readouts uh, to calculate dates in four different calendar systems up to 250 years in advance. So you could pick a date in the future and dial it to a certain date on the calendar and it would tell you what date it was in all these other calendars. Uh, it would tell you what the phase of the moon would be on that date. It would tell you the position of the moon and sun in the zodiac. It would tell you the position of the five known planets in the zodiac. And it would tell you lunar and solar eclipse uh, dates that were possible. Uh, in other words, it wouldn't tell you when there'd be a lunar or solar eclipse. It would tell you on what dates it could and couldn't happen. And it would do all of that with the front panel and the back panel using these dial readouts, which is quite impressive. That's a 250-year scale that it had on it. Just turn one knob, and it does all the math automatically. So they had technology like that, and that's just one we know about. The Romans, we have a lot of Roman authors talking about a lot more of these machines. There are more complicated machines like this. These computers were around uh, and in a variety of different types, and they're writing about it. Uh, all the writing about it was destroyed, and all the machines were destroyed. We didn't even know uh, that the stories about them were true until we actually found one. So that, that's actually a significant development. But they were also doing mathematical laws of physics. Uh, the first, the law of the lever, is the first mathematical law uh, that we know to have been discovered. Uh, and that's uh, either Archimedes or someone shortly before Archimedes developed that. And they were developing uh, the laws of physics for the five basic machines, uh, the wedge or ramp, uh, the wheel, the lever, the pulley, the screw, and also gears. Uh, gearing was another science they were working on. Now all of this stuff, and I'll give you some more examples of other sciences they were working on, represent, what you see them doing, we see them talking about, it represents three fundamental values. And this is what the Greeks came up with and what the Romans have given to us and spread, because they spread it across the world. 
is these three basic scientific values, that curiosity is a moral good. This is something that went against a lot of other uh, religious and local sensibilities. This idea that it's okay, in fact, it's great to be curious and to ask questions and to doubt and to go exploring and try and figure stuff out. Empiricism is the primary mode of discovery. This is another thing that evidence trumps authority. It doesn't matter what your rank is or whatever, evidence ends any argument. Uh, that's actually a revolutionary and shocking idea uh, back then. And progress is both possible and valuable. In other words, you can achieve scientific progress. You can learn more about the nature of the world and how it works. Uh, and not only can you, that it's actually valuable to do so, it's worthwhile to pursue it. Uh, that's also something that was actually I innovative and new. So those three values are the values that drive science, and we get them uh, from the pagans. Uh, they don't come from the Bible. You won't find anything like any, three, any of these three things uh, are defended there. And ancient science was characterized as a result by a variety of features. One, it was liberation from dogmatism. Uh, questioning and doubt was valued. An emphasis on experiments and replicable observation. Opposition to pseudoscience. So they were actually developing an idea of what is real science and what is pseudoscience based on evidence-based standards. They really had serious concern about what methods worked and what didn't. What was bullshit and what wasn't. And promoting scientific progress. Uh, advances were sought and respected. Um, they admitted that error was possible uh, and correctable with future research. Uh, all of these scientists refer to things that they weren't sure about and gave ideas like, here's how you could explore this further in the future. Um, we're not sure about it now. This whole idea of doing that, uh, that is a feature of science. And this science uh, entangled itself with commerce and industry and resulted in uh, mechanization of the industry. And once they acquired water power, they figured out how to tap water power using uh, levers on the wheel, uh, they were able to achieve automation. Uh, so the first industrial revolution occurred under the Roman Empire. The second industrial revolution, of course, is fossil fuels, uh, which was allowed us to unleash vast quantities of power uh, that weren't available to us before. Had there been no fossil fuels, we would have been pretty much stuck with water power and wind power, which are about equal in terms of their motive capabilities. And of course, you might know the water mill. The water mill is a standard example. The water turns the wheel, the wheel turns the grinding stone, which grinds the grain. It's basically a robot that grinds your grain for you. It makes flour. Uh, so this is a, flour, a robotic flour factory, in a sense. Well, the Romans uh, figured out the different physics of this and were able to develop more effective uh, water wheels and able to tap the power and, and manipulate the energy and power of them considerably using gearing, overshot, undershot technologies, and so on. And here's an example of uh, the Roman uh, achievement in this. This is the Barbagall uh, flour mill. Uh, so this is a flour factory. Uh, it's been redated. It used to be dated to the Middle Ages. It's actually been redated to 115 AD. We now know that it was made in, right in the smack in the middle of the, at the height of the Roman Empire. Aqueducts were built to feed this system. So that when, here's another example of the aqueduct applying to industry and uh, automating factories. Uh, so aqueduct fed overshot system, 16 water mill grain factory in the south of France. It fed tens of thousands of people. This was a massive uh, undertaking. There were other applications of this water power. We had, they had automated stone and lumber saws. So they had lumber mills and stone mills that were actually sawing these things using water power. Uh, they had automated ore grinding and metal hammering. Automated sand grinding for glass uh, is probable. Uh, automated water pumps. They had mechanical clocks and public clock towers as well. Now that's just an example of the industrialization aspect of how mechanics as a science uh, helped industry. Um, there were other sciences they were working on in, in physical sciences. Uh, optics, for example. Uh, the Roman scientists Heron and Ptolemy, uh, most especially, they developed laws of reflection, laws of refraction. Uh, they first discovered and started describing the index of refraction. So the fact that light bends differently in different materials, whether it's glass or water and so on, they were exploring that and actually writing it down. Uh, the study of convex and concave lenses was just beginning, actually. Uh, the Roman Empire fell, or fell apart, uh, right after the first study was published on convex and concave lenses, um, and we don't even have it. Uh, it. We have like two sentences or a paragraph of it. Uh, the rest of it got torn away and lost. Thanks, Middle Ages. Um, <clears throat> and parabolic mirrors, which is mirrors that can magnify. Uh, hydrostatics. So hydrostatics is the use of, for example, laws of flotation and equilibrium. They knew why ob they actually knew physically why objects float and why objects that don't float, why they don't float. And they also knew that objects that don't float, you put any object in water if it sinks, that object weighs less in water. I don't know if you ever knew that. Uh, you can, and you can actually calculate exactly how much less it will weigh using the laws of uh, equilibrium, laws of hydrostatics. 
uh, principles of density and specific gravity. Uh, ship hull design was improved using this. The aqueduct siphon that I showed you earlier, that comes out of this science, uh, the ability to make water run uphill. Uh, in harmonics and acoustics, uh, this is one field where we know in the Roman Empire there was a woman. Uh, we don't get to hear about many female scientists because the Middle Ages weren't hot on them. Um, <clears throat> but one of them is Ptolemaeus, uh, writing probably around 50 BC or a little later. Uh, she was a widely respected expert in harmonic science at the time. Uh, and our next big author on that subject is Ptolemy. These are the things they knew. They knew sound was a wave of compressed air or matter. They knew pitch as a function of wavelength. They knew uh, laws of harmonics and resonance, harmonic resonance, and they were using these sciences to improve acoustic theater design. So this is the kind of thing. Uh, those of you who love the theater, uh, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, that's some of that. Um, pneumatics, which is the study of uh, air, air and steam. Uh, they knew hot air expands and cool air contracts. Uh, they knew principle of suction was an external force, that it was air pressure pushing things in. And they developed force pumps and air horns using this technology, as well as automated uh, theaters and automatic doors and things like that. Uh, astrophysics even, you'd think, how could they do astrophysics? Uh, well, here's some astrophysics they were able to successfully do. Uh, lunisolar tide theory. They figured out that not only does the moon affect the tides, but the position of the sun does so as well. And so they knew uh, that it was some sort of force projected by the moon and sun that was attracting uh, the water and making it go up and down. They're really close to universal gravitation as a concept. They'd figured out that comets were planets in wide orbits. Aristotle had insisted it was an atmospheric phenomenon, that uh, comets weren't up and uh, beyond that. Uh, but no, by the Roman period, they'd fully confirmed that comets were actually uh, things orbiting the whole system. And they discovered things like precession. Uh, the zodiac rotates in a period of 25,800 years. So the Earth doesn't just spin, but the Earth also wobbles. And that wobble takes 25,800 years to complete. And that's why all your astrological signs are wrong. Uh, if you didn't know that, you can look that up. <laughs> if you think you're a Sagittarius, you're not. Um, <laughs> And uh, mathematics, so they developed geometry, and formal science too, not just uh, practical applications, but uh, formally described and formally um, sort of proven theorems and things like that. In geometry, conics, trigonometry, both plane and spherical trigonometry, combinatorics even, this is a permutation theory, the foundation of probability theory, they were doing uh, works in combinatorics and algebra. They had a form of algebra that was forgotten in the Middle Ages and had to be completely reinvented later. That's just, I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. That's just a sample of some of the cool shit that they were developing in their sciences. Uh, and you can see all of this is being powered by these scientific ideals. And you can see how none of that was being powered by ideals in the Bible. And in fact, when the ideals of the Bible, including the New Testament, get implemented on a state level, uh, which would be described the Middle Ages, um, all this stuff stopped. All this research stopped. No one continued doing it. Now, the, we can't blame Christianity for uh, the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome we can blame for Christianity, actually. Uh, it was the fall of Rome that actually gave us a Christian world. Because as things fell apart, people started looking for supernatural ways, uh, mystical ways to escape things going to hell. And Christianity actually became dominant at exactly that time. If you look at this chart here, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire actually begins around 235 AD. And you can see the Constantine, who's the first Christian emperor who it starts inst instantiating Christianity as a state religion, that comes after 300, so it's, it comes later. And the, the world becomes Christian in a century or two after that. Now what happened during the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? During the 235 to about 275 AD, uh, we had a 50 year long civil war. Uh, that's also thanks to the pagans because they couldn't uh, figure out their sh uh, And then the, their fiduciary economy collapsed uh, at the end of it. So imagine if our civil war, which lasted five years, had lasted 50 years instead. Uh, imagine how destructive that would have been. And then at the end of it, you had the Great Depression. We would have been hosed. It would have been like road warrior time. Uh, that's what happened to the Roman Empire, right? And then what happened immediately after that, within a generation after that? Constantine rises to power and brings Christianity with him. So uh, Christianity is essentially a religion that arose post-road warrior uh, in the early history of the West, um, not pre-road warrior. And that's significant because once the Christians took over, they didn't have the values in place 
to keep implementing these things uh, that were actually driving the success and uh, uh, the economic and other successes of the Roman Empire. And consequently, things went to hell in a handbasket and stayed there. They didn't come back for another thousand years. And they didn't really re resurrect until we started regaining those values, those pagan values, and putting them back in. Uh, now, when the Renaissance people started trying to argue for these, these intellectuals started arguing for these pagan values to be reintrojected, they didn't call them pagan values because then that wouldn't sell. Uh, they had to try and come up with ways to pretend that they were Christian values. Uh, so they would invent all of these obscure Bible arguments to say, oh no, they were in there all along. They're not. But uh, the point being is they had to convince their fellow Christians to get these pagan ideas back in. Uh, and that led to the modern Western world. This is a proxy for uh, how successful the economies were at the time. Now we know the Romans were so successful in mining uh, there's a variety of different ways you mine uh, silver and various other materials that also produce lead. Uh, and so they had tons of lead, and so they used lead for a lot of things. But the cool thing about lead is that it gets into the atmosphere and gets trapped in the ice in polar ice caps. And so you can go there and you can core it, and you can pull up a core and you've got an entire record of the pollution history of the planet going back thousands of years. And so we can actually see how much lead production, in other words, how much mining and smelting was going on at different periods all the way back uh, to 750 BC in this case. Now you'll notice, look at that spike. It spikes out at about 50 CE, so 50 AD. And then you look about, oh, it starts to decline, uh, you know, shortly after that, but it really starts declining after 250. So that's the fall of Rome there, the collapse of the Roman system. And then, of course, Constantine takes over, and then it's really down, and it really bottoms out at 850 uh, AD. And it doesn't come back until about, you see, 1450 AD, and it's still not comparable to the Roman Empire, right? So that's 1450, so that's you know, the, the top end of the Renaissance. Uh, we still hadn't gotten back to the, the scale of industrial production that was going on under the Romans. We have other proxies for these kinds of measurements. Shipwrecks. Uh, the number of shipwrecks you have is a proxy for how many ships there were, right? So there's a fixed percentage of ships sink. So if you see more shipwrecks, that means there were more ships. If there's more ships, that means there's more trade. Uh, more trade means a better economy. Uh, and look at, it's the exact same freaking graph, right? Um, huge spike under the Romans. And then you look at 1500 AD, look how puny that is. 1500 AD, compare that to any point in the Roman Empire, it was like massively uh, more active. So huge amounts of trade, huge decline in trade. Oh, and that big dip again, that, that's by the way the Dark Ages, that little hole in there. Uh, and here's another one, uh, urbanization. So the size of cities. I remember I mentioned if you can't put water into these cities, you can't maintain them. So as these aqueduct systems weren't being supplied uh, or they're falling apart, um, cities declined and other things resulted in the decline of city populations. And you see here a huge dip. Uh, you see urbanization recovers around 1300. Uh, it starts to drop just after 200, and what do you got in there? That's the Middle Ages, that huge decline to about half. Uh, so basically, half of all urban populations disappeared. It's worth pointing out that uh, what you're looking at is the deaths of tens of millions of people that are starving, literally starving to death. So we're actually destroying half the population of Europe and the Mediterranean by not being able to feed and take care of them by simply not adopting the values necessary to create an industry and a science that can do so. Uh, well, um, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, they did that. Um, thank you. I'll take uh, yeah. You keep mentioning anti-intellectualism yeah. as being a uh, downfall of a lot of these societies. Do you want to come out of that with um, current society? <laughs> <laughs> it's worrying, right? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so if we end up in road warrior scenario, uh, anti-intellectualism. The, the thing is, and I talk about this in my book, The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire, because it's really key, that there was, there was a lot of anti-intellectualism, even among pagans, but there was the lower classes that were uh, thought that uh, all this logic and science is very hoity-toity and very offensive to their religious sensibilities. But they were powerless, right? So they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and so that's what allowed progress to proceed because all the elite who were the people getting the educations and funding the science and doing the science were, were basically immune to this uh, mindset. Uh, it's when they became uh, obsessed with that mindset that everything went to hell, right? Uh, so. Um, 
the, the lesson you look at is from case to case to case. You look at the, what happened in Islamic history as an example, and in China, is if the anti-intellectualists are the ones who are in power and get to make decisions about what your education will be, who's allowed to say what, uh, that kind of thing. So that w when they have that kind of power and can shut down the intellectuals, can shut down scientists and things like that, that's when, you, that's when things go to hell. So you have to have the combination of anti-intellectualism and power. Uh, so you gotta really watch out for those two. Make sure they don't meet. <laughs> What's that? Or screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet, but uh, there's cause for concern. I would say that. Yeah. Going back to the, uh, like the anti-science movement, what, what usually historically has been the, the, the shift point where the, where the, the anti-science becomes gets to power and starts to. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's done a general study to try and see if there's common patterns case by case by case. I don't know. Uh, I can describe to you what happened in the West uh, in terms of the, the happenstance sequence of events where Constantine came into power. You had the collapse of society right before that, and you had people responding to that collapse of society with desperate measures. Uh, the pagans came up with fascism. That was their number one result. Was kill, death penalty for everything was their solution to everything. Uh, controlled economy price controls from the state. Basically all the worst decisions you can make uh, when you're trying to recover from a collapse like they were. Uh, and then of course when the Christians came into power, just by happenstance, dice roll, an emperor won a civil war who happened to be, uh, who happened to think Christianity was a great tool to use to unite the empire. And other emperors had tried other religions before them, but they didn't last long. They got assassinated before they could do it. And the only reason Christianity survived is because Constantine didn't get assassinated. He actually survived 30 years or so. So he actually got to implement, and, and his sons inherited, so he actually got to implement and his dynasty got to implement Christianity in a way no prior emperor was able to implement any other religion. Uh, so, um, and that religion itself happened to come with this package of anti-intellectualism, that it was better for society to not be curious, it was better for society that you just trust authority and not uh, try to trump authority with evidence. It was better for society if you kept things the way they were, stopped trying to make progress and improve things. Um, th these are the, this is the package of ideals. And this is a very reactionary system that you probably, this might be a commonality if you look case after case after case. When people get worried about things going on in society, they sort of retreat to these ideas, uh, and it's hard to get people to overcome that. And that might be part of what causes these anti-intellectual movements and uh, drives them when they're in power. Yeah. Who is preserving at least the you know political philosophy that it was around for the Enlightenment to rediscover and mm -hmm. start writing about? Right. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it varies. There's, there's scraps of stuff that was survived everywhere, right? So you have some libraries are preserving his, uh, Cicero for a thousand, two thousand, five hundred years. Um, it must have been taught or something as part of a classical education? Not necessarily, actually. Um, so, like, the, the books would be preserved, and you would go to college and you'd be educated in how to read them, and then you would have to go find the book and read it. Uh, they, would, they wouldn't be part of the curriculum. So like they weren't reading Cicero as part of it, or at least not a lot of Cicero's. If they were reading Cicero, they were reading his speeches, not his philosophy, uh, as part of their curricula. So you had to actually actively be curious and go find these other books and get excited by them. Um, and that's what happened with social contract theory with Epicurus. Uh, someone, there's one guy found one manuscript of the writings of Epicurus. What was the De Rerum Natura, actually? It was Lucretius' uh, Latin advertisement for Epicureanism, but then that led to finding more Epicurean stuff. Um, but that, so they, they, well, this is a neat book. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of Christian people are like, I don't like this book. This is like an anti God book. And so that they, they really had to, like, have their own subculture pushing this book. It wasn't, it wasn't being pushed in the universities at all. Uh, the universities were like, oh, we don't like this. Uh, right? This is, doesn't, this disagrees with Aristotle. And Aristotle is our guy because he's pro God. Um, that was. It seems like a lot of our enlightenment ideas came from Scotland, that, and they were educating there. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know. You have to talk to someone who's an expert in the Scottish Enlightenment. But here's a hypothesis: is that Scotland is already kind of a bit of a rebel uh, area of the world at that time. So they're already are maybe inclined to think against the system and start reading books that maybe other people aren't reading, and then getting excited by the ideas in them, and then starting to promulgate them. That's a hypothesis. I don't know if that matches the facts, but you have, if you talk to a historian of the period, they could tell you whether that's a viable hypothesis or not. So, so literally, they. Yes, uh, and no, some just barely survived the Middle Ages. Like some, they exist only in a couple manuscripts. Uh, Archimedes, for example, it survived, only one manuscript of Archimedes survived, and it was 
all the ink was scraped off and hymns to God written over it. Uh, so it, it didn't even really survive. Now that's called a palimpsest. We have a lot of these where the, in the Middle Ages they were just starving for materials so they would just scrape the ink off of something, something ancient and then write hymns to God over it or something like that. Usually something stupid. Uh, and, and it's usually written over something awesome. Uh, but you know, that's the Middle Ages for you. Uh, but this one Archimedes Codex uh, actually, um, for, we knew about it for about a hundred years. We were trying to like, like look at it with weird light and try to reconstruct what was there. Eventually, in the early 21st century, uh, they put it into a particle accelerator at Stanford and uh, they knew where all the ink that's written on there was so they could tell the computer where that ink was and they just had the cloud chamber calculate where all the iron atoms are in there and subtract the existing ink and the remaining iron atom traces was the old ink. So they used the particle accelerator to reconstruct the treatise of Archimedes. Uh, there's a book written on this, it's great, uh, called the Archimedes Codex, I highly recommend it. Um, Archimedes would have been proud, but uh, that's the kind of shit we have to go through to recover some of this stuff. 99% uh, of it was destroyed and lost forever, and we only know about it from references in other literature. Uh, so we have, for example, Plutarch wrote this big long uh, collection of essays called The Moral Essays, uh, and we don't even have it complete, but it's a huge thing in the, uh, some libraries found it really popular in the Middle Ages, they liked him. Uh, and uh, he has this one section, this one book on the face and the moon, uh, you know, because the moon looks like it has a face in it. And it has two sections. One is a myth section and one is a science section. And in the science section, he re has, uh, represents these other scientists and intellectuals arguing about the moon and stuff. And they reference a whole bunch of other science. And we, so they reference all these other books and things that, that were like, oh my God, why don't we have those? <laughs> uh, so we have things like that where we, we have references to books and what was in them, but we've lost those books. Uh, other than that, most everything, most of what we have was uh, preserved in the East, not in the West, uh, preserved in Greek mostly, and it moved West when the Constantinople fell, so uh, in the 1400s. Uh, so as scholars were fleeing, they were moving West. Also some of the Arabs that were fleeing the anti-intellectualism brought some of these Greek treatises with them as well to Europe, uh, so Spain actually had a cache of these things. Uh, and then uh, we have some that are preserved only in Arabic, uh, that are translations of Greek texts. In fact, there's several Arabic treatises that used to be thought they were original Arabic science, but now we know were, were actually translations of ancient uh, manuscripts. Um, but we also know some that are outright translations. So some of our own legacy only survives in foreign language. These have all been great questions, by the way. I'm surprised that every single question that's been asked, I actually cover in my books. <laughs> Uh, anything else you want to know about me, uh, richardcarrier.info. Uh, I teach courses every month, including a course on ancient science. Um, I have like nine courses in philosophy and in ancient history. Every month I teach a different one, uh, so you can find out about that there. My okay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.